Welcome to Reality TV, your source for snarky reality TV recaps of all the shows we love and love to hate. From TLC to MTV, a and &E to Bravo and more, no show is off limits to the truth as I see it, all from the couch just like you. I'm Jody, your inner voice and best friend who says all the things you're thinking, but you have the manners to never say aloud. Be sure you're subscribed to the show so you never miss a week and find me everywhere at Reality TV Pod. Support the show and score some amazing perks and merch, as well as some bonus episodes at Patreon dot com slash reality tv pod now sit back it's time to get salty Hello and welcome back to Reality TV. I'm your host Jody for my new listeners and this week, what a show. We had the tell all of sister wives and tell all of seeking sister wives. Now first I am going to thank the one, the onlys, Abby Berghaus, Bergheis, I hope I'm saying your name correctly, Sabrina Romo, and Shannon Smith. They are the newest Patreon subscribers, and I cannot wait to talk some juicy and salty shit with you. So thank you. Your stickers are on the way, and I hope you love the Baddest Apples Facebook group. If you want to get in on Patreon, what are you waiting for? Head on over to patreon.com slash realitybpod. You you get so much bang for such little bucks. Five bucks a month gets you early ad-free episodes, free stickers. If you sign up at the $10 level, you get a keychain, stickers. And at both the $5 and $10 level, you get an invite to the Secret Baddest Apple Facebook group where we are sharing lots of good stuff. And honestly, it's just a lovely community of awesome, snarky men and women. So head on over to Patreon com slash reality pod. Oh, and hello, almost forgot to tell you, you get over 70 bonus episodes. I release most of the time three to four bonus episodes every month. Head on over there. Last week I had my mom on who is just freaking hysterical. She doesn't know how funny she is. This week, you know what? I haven't decided. I have a lot of really good blind items I want to talk about. Next week, I'm going to be talking about this book, Women Who Punch, the back scene, behind the scenes look at The View. You know what? I'm just going to jump into the shallow end of the news because I want to talk a little bit about the book right now. This novel is by Ramin Satuda, and I got the audiobook because, well, I'm not a huge reader, okay? I'd rather listen to someone reading to me than actually looking at words on paper because I'm just super intelligent like that. No matter how you are listening to it, reading it, you gotta get it. Not only are you getting dirt on the women, and he really goes into each individual co-host that has ever been on The View, which is quite incredible because there's been so many more of them than I even remember. There's someone on there who was named Jedediah. Don't remember that at all. I just feel like I had a lapse in a couple years there. One of the things he talked about, and I actually was walking my dog laughing out loud because the ridiculousness of it but the fact that it actually happened is unbelievable. Bill Clinton, I'm talking former President Bill Clinton, told Barbara Walters that he is a huge fan of Sherry Shepard, and he was not kidding. And it turns out, and I'm going to use Sherry Shepard's words here, she said Bill Clinton loves, quote, black movies. As a matter of fact, when he came on The View, he went to Barbara Walters and said, have you seen Sherry in Who's Your Caddy? And he recited lines from the movie. He told Sherry he had seen the movie at least five times. He also loved One for the Money. I haven't seen either of these movies, but apparently Bill Clinton is Sherry Shepard's number one fan, which I don't know why. I just find it absolutely hysterical. I see him sitting down eating, well, not McDonald's because he's all about his health now. Uh, let's just say sunflower seeds. I don't know, it sounds kind of healthy. I just see him sitting there popping sunflower seeds down his throat and laughing away, losing his breath, like one of those kind of airy, gaspy laughs as Hillary, if she's there looking on like, oh my God, this is what my life has come to. So check that book out and then uh, join me over on Patreon because we're going to be talking all about it. Now, another story that jumped out at me in the UK Daily Mail, my girl Carrie from Sip and Shine, my co-host at Moms on the Rocks, she loves UK Daily Mail. And now I am looking at it every single morning as if it's the New York Times. 
This story about a Florida man who was 75 years old. He accidentally fell down and was killed by a six foot tall, 130 pound cassowary. You heard me right, and you probably were thinking, what the hell is a cassowary? It's a huge bird. It looks kind of like an emu, okay? I do feel badly for the guy. I want to just put that out there. The man died. I feel badly for him. However, why are we breeding things like this? Private owners, okay? Private owners, private people, citizens, they can own a giant, basically a dinosaur, okay? This is like a dinosaur bird. No bird should be weighing 130 pounds. It's the most deadly, dangerous bird on the face of this earth, and anyone can get one. Well, maybe not anyone. I'm sure there's some sort of rules and regulations, but apparently not enough. They have four-inch dagger-like claws on each foot, and I just don't understand why this animal, okay, PETA, don't come after me. All animals should have a right to live, blah, blah, blah. But what is the point of a cassowary? I mean, if it can kill anything in its path, isn't it beyond like evolution? Like I said, it's like a dinosaur. Do we really need them around? I just think breeding and owning, I'm just going to narrow this down to cassowaries. Please don't overgeneralize this. And okay, just go with me here. This is a snarky fucking podcast. I just think having a bird like that is like raising children to run around with knives or guns in their hands and be like, oh, since we can do it, let's do it. It's like having a brood of a toddler Edward Scissorhand clones. It just does not make sense. Again, RIP, but I just think we need to figure out a system where if you want to breed dangerous animals, maybe you have to breed them for a purpose. Remember the lady who was on Oprah? She had her face ripped off by an orangutan, her friend's orangutan. Like, why do you need those animals in your home? Why do you need them on your land? If it's like a sanctuary or they're in a zoo or something, I understand that. I just think in the case of dangerous animals, what's the purpose? Maybe you raise them for like guards, guards for a prison. Whoa, that might actually be genius. Actually think about that. I don't want to take away jobs from the actual human guards though, because you know, society and economics and all that kind of stuff. But actually, what if we had cassowaries, not orangutans because they're cute. Let's have cassowaries, these birds, roam like in a field around, almost like you would have a moat around a prison. Cassowaries roaming high security prisons. But not every prison, not like 60 days in where it's the county jail or the state jail, whatever you call them, but maybe just like the high security ones with serial killers and rapists and pedophiles. It's like prisons and cassowaries could be the modern day Australia. I'm just throwing that out there. Maybe we should, you know, dig into that a little bit. All right. Well, this is a point in the news that I have to talk about because it has to do with reality TV. I'm talking about John Francetic and Dr. Jessica from Married at First Sight. I am not judging them for being together, although I do think it toes the line of some ethical things there. But that aside, okay, I don't like them because of how they are on social media. I never liked John. There's just something about him that's icky. But listen to this. They got engaged over the weekend. And if you want to know the whole backstory, just go and look at Radar or look at Us Weekly or look at my favorite sarcasm. But John posted on his Instagram and there's this picture of him. It's very staged. They try to make it look like it's not, but it is. He's looking up or at the camera and she's looking down laughing, her hand with a big diamond ring on it, just, you know, perfectly posed for the camera. And John's caption says, I just love how happy she looks. Oh, and we got engaged at the Grand Canyon yesterday. And now at Dr. Jessica Griffin is mine forever. Er, 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 er. There's like four R's. Hashtag she's mine. Hashtag nervous wreck. At Grand Canyon Adventures. At M. Pope Fine Jewelers. So, okay, we know that the ring was comped or he got it for a steep discount because last I checked, I don't think he has a job. Now, I clicked on Dr. Jessica's profile. I'm pulling it up right here because I don't want to be accused of misquoting anything. 
And speaking of quotes, Dr. Jessica is known to take basically any phrase at all, and she makes a little image and smacks Dr. Jessica on the bottom. So for example, she's got one right here, our words become our children's inner voices. Dr. Jessica. No, Dr. Jessica. I know her for a fact. I heard that long before I was married and I had kids from Oprah. So don't even try to steal Oprah's thunder. Now I want to go to this photo and I'm just going to read her whole caption here. And I think you'll know why I can't stand either of them. I have always said you can find love in extraordinary ways. You just have to follow your heart and be you. Nobody other than you and the right person will find you. If he's persistent enough and eventually hunts you down and won't take no for an answer, laughing cry face. For the first time in my history of knowing him, John was at a loss for words and a total adorable mess on his knee. So of course I said yes, just helping a guy out, winky face. Today, we celebrated yesterday's Grand Canyon engagement by a sick mountain bike trail in Sedona, where I decided to face plant via an endo, and she puts in parentheses, where you flip head over feet over your handlebars. Yeah, I think we got it. And landed on my face, likely breaking my nose, bike landing on top of me and jacked up both legs. Zoom in for the proof. Hey, in my defense, I was a little distracted by this incredible guy, and it's all these hearts and heart face. I love you with everything I have at John. Hashtag love wins. Hashtag engaged. Hashtag she said yes. Now, please don't hate me if you enjoy them as a couple. Like I said, go ahead and like them. And I'm putting all the ethical stuff aside. I just find any couple in general who goes so over the top about loving each other and I love this guy and look at this gal, hashtag nervous wreck, it's just insufferable. Take it off the internet. Tell it to each other. We don't all need to know. Still not convinced and think I'm an asshole? Let me just leave you with this and then we are going to move on. This was posted by John back in October when they became public, and it's clearly a selfie that he is taking of the two of them kissing each other. You can see his arm kind of outstretched. And this is what John had to say. I love the ocean in the most pure way I know. It's vast and deep and beautiful. When I'm on it, I'm free, and when I'm in it, I'm home. When life gets chaotic, it calms me. It's beautiful and balanced, yet relentless and powerful. I'm my most happy and content self when surrounded by the ocean. So you must understand, it's not the blue of the ocean I see in your eyes. It's love, pure love, at Dr. Jessica Griffin. (sighs) Do you hear me now? All right, well, let's jump into Sister Wives the Tell All. And right off the bat, we notice that we have a new host, Su Chin Pak. She is not a new TV personality to me and probably to a lot of you who used to watch MTV. She used to do some of the MTV Music Award shows with Kurt Loder. She also does the voiceovers for MTV True Life, and I think she also does it for MTV Cribs, if that is still on. I don't even know, but I know she used to do it. It's just an iconic voice, and I really like her. I did not like her sweater with that little... I can't tell if it was like a dicky or if it was like a little baby headband neckline necklace thing. I'll allow it because she's a journalist and I feel like just like comedians can kind of get away with certain things, a journalist can get away with wearing something that looks fucking crazy. So we had a lot of changes, a lot of moves, and a lot of blazers. Good lord. The wives must have gone to the dress barn for a little buy to get to free because all four of them had the exact same blazer, but in different shades. All of them a tight on the upper arm polyester. And I'm not dissing them because you guys know that I have Oprah arms too. I understand it. But I also understand that you don't wear a blazer that pulls on your arms like that. It's just going to make you uncomfortable And all of us at home watching Uncomfortable because we know that you probably got some flop sweat going underneath there. So I did not approve of the blazer thing. Just maybe a nice sweater, a nice cardigan, something that moves, something that breathes, but no. 
Now we got to talk about Cody. He is seated between his two favorite wives, Christine and Robin. He's sporting a looser curl, not quite the scrunched up curl that we saw. I don't think he used his home diffuser. Maybe there was one at the hotel. It definitely was not his personal one because you could tell he was kind of messing with it a little bit. He also has the mustacheless goatee. He's really sticking to that look. I'd love to see how that grows out or how is he going to transition all that? Is he just going to take it all off? No facial hair? I don't think that's a good look either. But you know what? That is his cross to bear. I just hope maybe there's a good barber in Flagstaff who can talk him off the ledge. Oh, I probably shouldn't say that because isn't Flagstaff kind of near the Grand Canyon? I don't mean an actual ledge. I just mean give him some advice what to do with his head and his face. I do want to point out that Mary did not appear to be wearing LuLaRoe. She was wearing some jeggings. I mean, you couldn't dress it up a little bit. And what also looks to be like one of those wooden baby teething necklaces. But, you know, let's give her a break. She could have been peeling some more bananas or having a flash sale. She's liquidating her rapidly depreciating LuLaRoe inventory. She didn't have time to clean herself up a bit, okay? I'm being understanding. I'm giving her the benefit of the doubt. Now, Su Chin, that clever, clever woman, she said that she's not bringing up the past about the catfish just to talk about the past. It's more to help frame what's going on between Cody and Mary presently. I mean, man, that is some genius spin right there. She got those catfish clips in there. I know she did just for us. And you guys, that season, if we could go back to it and watch it for the first time, I'm talking about the season where Mary was neck deep, or I should say throat deep, (laughs) into the whole catfish scenario, where she was talking to this guy online who ended up being a girl, but no one knew it was going on. She's at the table and she's like, don't be surprised if suddenly one day I'm gone, just framing her own disappearance. It was just such a special time. It's almost like looking back onto your childhood Christmas memories. It just has that warm and fuzzy glow to it. That was just its peak. I think we had the Brown family mission statement going on at the same time and we had lots of wet bar and the tall gargantuan chair showing up every now and then. Hmm, memories. Okay, well, presently, Mary and Cody are on better terms. They're even dating now. Cody ate dinner with Mary once, and she actually wants to consume food with him again in the future. So you could say things are getting pretty serious. Okay, well, I'm actually kind of torn on talking about this because on one hand, it's incredibly awkward even for someone like me to see a couple who has been together for, what, 20 plus years talking like they're middle schoolers who maybe held hands once. But on the other hand, I think we do have to give them credit for being open and honest about the fact that they have not been really married for a while It's pretty shocking that they are being that honest. I wish they would give more specifics, of course, but I think it goes without saying that we can assume they haven't been intimate or anything even close to it for a long time. But, you know, this isn't hurting Mary the most. You know who it hurts the most? Robin. You see, she was there for all of their separation, so it really affected her. Robin. Shut up while you are ahead. You got the marriage certificate. You got the biggest house and the greenest grass of everyone. Just zip it while you are ahead. Now, the brown teenagers and Maddie and Hunter show up, and Gwendolyn shed some light on how gravity works in Flagstaff as compared to Las Vegas. I was going to kind of make fun of her on this, but number one, she's a minor, and number two, she might just be correct because I thought Utah was like more up, more north towards Idaho until like two weeks ago. Okay. I'm truly what the song American Idiot is all about. So maybe Gwendolyn does have some NASA intel and baby boys that are born and bred in the Southwest in Arizona. They're just, I don't know, they're different. They're cuter, they're blonder, whatever the hell she said. 
Now let's talk about what we all want to talk about, and that is Janelle's sons. Hunter. I adore that kid. And I call him kid because to me, he's always just going to be like 16. Now, in reality, he's in the military. I think he's at the Air Force Academy. He's obviously smart. He loves his family. I think he was very articulate in complimenting Gabe. And also, I just really like him. I respect him. I think he's a great kid. Gabe, also a great kid. They focused on him this season, kind of having, I don't want to call him temper tantrums. He was just being a typical teenager. I just think he's a great kid. And when he got emotional about his brother, oh, I loved it. I think Janelle just knows what she is doing and teaching her kids about street smarts and being logical and being in touch with your emotions and how to express them in a good way. And maybe it's the tough love part of Janelle because she has shown us that in the past, or maybe it's just being very honest with them. Whatever it is, she is doing it right. I think she's a really good mom. Even Maddie, who I have talked about, she can drive me nuts with Caleb. But even Maddie pulled it together. She got to the point without making dumb jokes or relying on generalities like sometimes some of the kids can do. I do wish Garrison would have spoken up because I think he looked great. You can tell he's got that military, oh, what do you what is it? Like the discipline or just how he's posturing himself. He's all fit. He looks mature. Ah. Janelle's kids. What can I say? They're my favorite, along with Christine's kids, Isabel and Peyton. And Dayton, he was there too. He didn't say much, which is fine. It was good to see him. And I got a little hate on social media that I'm picking favorite kids. And how dare you pick favorite kids? They could be reading this or listening to this. But listen, I am not their mom. I am not picking a favorite child. I just find Janelle's kids and Isabel and Peyton and Dayton a true pleasure to watch on TV. Now we got a few laughs out of Cody about being a poopy head and saying the word shit and flock that was thrown around Mary's B&B. And then we get to the last segment, the motherfucking Parowan house. Walls up, walls up, Mary's walls are up. Now, despite some pretty awkward scenes from the season, flashbacks to where everyone thought the B&B was a horrible idea because, you know, we all know the B&B is not actually a B&B. It's Mary's mom's house. Everyone seems to be on the same page and they're all smiles. Mary is like beaming. She's so proud of this freaking dollhouse. But then we go to Cody and Su Chin asks, okay, so... It's been a while. Seems like your opinion has changed, that you're totally supportive of this investment of Mary's. And that's where we leave it because Cody starts shifting with his blazer. Maybe he put Robin's on an accident or something. He's clearly uncomfortable and Mary's face just fucking falls. And I think they're going to have it out next week. So a big boo to just cutting it off right there. Give us at least a little bit more Hunter or Mariah. I guess that's next week, but it's going to be a long week until then. But next up, we have something to look forward to, and that is the two-hour tell-all of Seeking Sister Wife. Su Chin is back, and thankfully, she survived the same bear who attacks Mariah in Audrey's jeans. Su Chin managed to escape with just some chewed up sleeves, thank God, because she has the face of an angel. I really am a huge fan of Su Chin. So much, in fact, that during our little break here, I did a little Google search, dug deep, not too deep, first Wikipedia page, but I found out that Su Chin is married to this guy. I think his name's Mike Bender. He's the founder of AwkwardFamilyPhotos.com. Do you love her even more now that you know she's got a great sense of humor? What a gift to TLC. Now let's talk about Bernie. (laughs) He is back with a whole new look. Not really a whole new look, just uh, a little just for men's at home hair rinse. I was kind of worried and concerned at first because I was thinking, oh God, that looks really dark. What if it's the same kind of shoe polish powder thing that Joe Gorga used on Real Housewives of New Jersey? But as soon as they zoomed in a little bit, I could see that it probably needed a little darker tint or a toner or something. There was no powder residue, so phew. Thank God for that, because later there could have been a tussle. You know what I'm talking about. 
interesting to see that all the men were seated behind all the wives on the couches. I liked it. I liked it a lot, especially for Mr. Snowden, Dmitry Seneca Snowden, because you know he wanted to be like Bethany Frankel, always getting the seat next to Andy. He wanted to be right next to Su Chin, but nope, it was the backyard for you, buddy. Now, then we get into it. We get a little recap of the season, and then we get focused right in on the Aldridges, and holy shit, this tell all brought it. I'm picturing those little hand clapping emojis right here. This tell all might be better than even some of the 90 Day Fiance tell alls. Jennifer, remember the would be sister wife? She agreed to do this pre video interview with producers ahead of time. And we find out that Jennifer claimed to have given birth to a baby girl. Now, when producers asked to see her pictures of the baby or, hey, can we see the nursery? Jennifer refused, and then she tried to change the subject really quick. She had this weird screaming, laughing, very jittery demeanor about her, which I thought was really scary. All the other people on the stage, I think, were just as scared as all of us because they were slack-jawed, they're stunned, there was lots of hands over the mouths. And interesting, they didn't show Colton yet, though. Did you notice that? I was thinking maybe Colton was either crying because he had never seen anything where, you know, someone spoke above a whisper or he was really turned on and maybe he was like jerking off behind Tammy and had to take off to go warm up a cup of milk in a sippy cup or something. (laughs) I don't know why. I just feel like Colton walked out of this tell-all a more broken man than he ever has. Like he has seen some things. All right, well, back to Jennifer. So there's this new information of a baby girl, and also there's a new boyfriend. Not only that, there's even bigger news. Oh, what's the scuttlebutt? Turns out Jennifer has agreed to call in to the tell-all, and oh, here go hell come. I mean, where do we even start? We thought that the Snowdens brought a lot of drama. Jennifer, whoa. Uh, Well, let's start with the fact that she had lots of filler in her lips. It kind of distracted from the crazy cackling she was doing and the lack of blinking. Go back and watch the girl. I don't know if she's on something or if it's just purely a mental chemistry kind of thing. She's just nuts, okay? Her strategy to come in guns blazing and laughing at everyone was the worst strategy ever. It totally backfired on her because the Aldridges did not respond to it. They just remained very calm. And what are you going to do with someone like Vanessa? Okay, I'm going to be honest about Vanessa. I really like her. I respect her. But I also am terrified by her. Anyone who has that calm, purposeful speech pattern, very deliberate demeanor, it intimidates me. And I think Jennifer was forced, much like what Jeff was saying, She was forced to own up to her lies or forced to take some sort of accountability as much as we wanted her to. Of course not. I don't think she took any accountability at all, but I also don't think dragging her sister, who I really think is Jamie Lynn Spears being held against her will, I don't think bringing the sister into it was wise at all. I do believe that the sister may have been the one to actually type the text, Jennifer died, but come on. Jennifer told her to do it. No one does that. Just, oh, I'm just going to text someone randomly and say that you're dead. I also don't think that there's a baby, but if there is, let's just hope wherever Jennifer is living, there are mental health care facilities nearby. That's going to be a rough road, I think, for Jennifer. I don't think this 15 minutes of fame is going to be a beneficial thing to her in her life. Okay, so let's hop over to the Snowdens. We get a long montage of the Snowdens greatest hits, including the vaginal steaming. And surprisingly, Jeff seemed the most interested in this. And actually, so did Sharice, which color me prude because I thought Sharice would kind of be like me, like kind of giggle her way out of it, crack a joke. But she was actually kind of into it. And she was like, that actually sounds like a wonderful thing to do after childbirth. I actually disagree with that. I don't think anything else needs to come out after childbirth. 
there's already been enough things coming out of, let's not steam after that. Just take your six weeks off and that's about it. But uh, not only Sharice, Colton's wives, Tammy, or was it Sophie? Sophie was like, "Uh, Tammy, do you pretty please want to go get your vagina steamed with me? They were all about it, which makes me wonder, maybe the Mrs. Colton's are all yeasty and now they're just putting the pieces together like, oh, that's why. And Bernie, way to make everyone uncomfortable with your bright red face giggling. I don't think it was because Bernie was uncomfortable or embarrassed at all. I think Bernie, in fact, knowing what we know now, he's the type of guy who's now going to go look for some noni steam porn next time he's alone. Remember, he's a young brunette buck now. He's looking to spread his seed. Ugh. Now, at this point, I honestly was getting a little annoyed. Yes, I love the tell-all, but it was very light and fluffy. Like, I felt everyone's going to do a little cheerleading move, a little basket toss. Yay, go polygamy! But quickly, things changed, at least for me, when Su Chin turned to Dimitri and Ashley and said, you know, Vanessa has made a lot of concessions for your relationship. What concessions have you made for Vanessa? Thank you, Su Chin. This is why you are a true journalist. So let's just recap this, right? Vanessa moved states. She was living in Seattle. She moved to Los Angeles. She gave up a job. She took on full-time nanny duties without pay. She changed her diet, her pH, probably a lot of other stuff that we don't even see on camera. So yeah, Demetri and Ashley, what have you done? Now, Dimitri, Seneca Snowden, he assures Su Chin, of course they've made concessions. And so Su Chin asks, like what? <laughs> I loved it. She wanted specifics, but of course, Dimitri didn't have any. He's just sitting there like, uh-huh, humana, humana, humana. Well, I had to learn when to back off and when to push more. With Ashley, I know her so well that I can finish her sentence. And then he left it at that. Well, that's not making a concession, Dimitri. That's just getting to know Vanessa. That's basic when you push, when you back off. And number one, you shouldn't be judging your relationship on how much you push someone or back off. That kind of has a controlling nuance to it. It's, it was just total BS. And I wish Su Chen would have followed through on that and got an answer out. But okay, she uh, just got out of a bear attack on her shirt. So we'll give her a break. My generosity at this point is pretty much all extended because we get Ashley's mom on and it suddenly turns to Vanessa being on the hot seat. Why the fuck was this happening? Why is Ashley suddenly struck with a case of the silences? She had no problem speaking for Vanessa all season long. Yet now, when her beloved new sister wife that she loves so much is in tears, Vanessa is sobbing, grabbing tissues because of something Ashley's mom said to her. Ashley says nothing. Total silence. Let's not forget, Ashley was all pissed off and pouting at the wedding when Vanessa's sister just questioned her motives. But when it's Ashley's mom putting heat on Vanessa, it's okay. Ashley has nothing to say to help defend her. Mm -mm -mm. I don't trust Ashley at all. I think Ashley is the one who wants to be on TV, clearly because she and Dimitri were the ones who were on the show long before they even met Vanessa. So, Mother Pot, meet your daughter, Kettle. More on the Snowdens in just a bit, but we're going to jump to bro time. (laughs) I was laughing to myself because I was thinking, you know Cody Brown is watching that, and he would have loved to have been up there with all of the brother husbands, I guess you would call them. I almost feel badly for him because, you know, Cody, he would have loved to get down and wrestle with some of these guys. Now let's talk about Dimitri. They talk a little bit about how he cheated on Ashley. Let's just say it like it is. He cheated on Ashley with Jocelyn, but Dimitri tries to spin it like he always does using words like framework. Maybe he learned that in his ontological architect school. He's just, he's the same narcissist as always. No surprise from Dimitri. Now Bernie, 
wow, I don't think he came off any better in this tell-all. I kind of actually forgot about the sexting thing, but something about being reminded of that combined with Bernie's painted on tight pants with his balls and his wiener just being, ugh, it looks like a like a fat baby's leg and pants or something between his legs. Ugh. It just, it creeped me out and it also gave me just creeper asshole vibes. Now, on the other hand, hear me out. Do not turn me off at this point. You have to hear the whole thing. I was actually downright charmed by Jeff Aldridge and Colton. It could be the facial hair, or it could just be them sitting next to Bernie and Dimitri. Look, I'm getting a little choked up. I just, I was really liking them. I think the beard on Colton has got to stay, though. If he shaves that off, just go away. I don't ever want to see you again. But if he grows that thing in and never uses a razor again, I am going to put him in the, I'll give him like a C grade. It's acceptable. I'm not going to apologize for calling him Kip from Napoleon Dynamite or saying maybe he just needs to practice the lower ranges of his octave ability. But I just, I think Colton with a beard, it, a beard does a body good. Now, after the men's segment, we have all the wives on stage and Colton's wife, Tammy, let's just talk about her for a second. She looked great. Love the hair length on her. I like that she wasn't wearing little baby butterfly clips and shit in her hair. Great color, that bright orange. Not a lot of people can pull it off. She looked fantastic. Actually, they all did. Minus Paige, who was wearing a very weird, itchy kind of button-up blouse. Didn't like it. And she had some weird foundation spots on her face. But all in all, they all looked good. Now they start talking about jealousy. And Ashley claims she never had it except for this one time, this one day. And it was when Vanessa got the day off from filming. Uh, yeah, Ashley, you're not helping your case. You're jealous because your nanny got a day off. Great. Good job. Now, at some point, Sharice has a little shining moment. She has some pearls of wisdom to tell us about plural marriage being about the little things. It's not the fact that your husband is having sex with someone else. It's just the day-to-day. -day. Turns out Tammy, Colton's second wife, really, really wants Colton to store his Izod shirts at her house. And Ashley jumps in to lay down what I call her sisterhood of the traveling pants advice. You have to think about how you can help your sister wives to, and you, now you have to use your hands. You put your hands up, palms facing yourself. It's, you have to do it this way or else Ashley's advice doesn't make sense. How can you help your sister wives to help us feel better? Now move your hands back and forth. You have to be more empathetic to your sister wife. And I'm just going to say she probably doesn't take her own advice because there's no way in fucking hell she ever put herself in Vanessa's shoes. And then I was distracted by her necklace. I couldn't decide whether I loved it, hated it. I wanted to love it, but I don't like Ashley. So I thought I hated it, but I was then not being true to myself. And then we shift all the focus back to Paige because Ashley says, Paige, I think you have some deeper issues. And then we go in on it. For once, the one time only, I need to thank Ashley because that's where we got the bombshell. Here we go. The Bernie, Paige, and Su Chin drama. We're talking about recapping the mini golf date. Yada, yada, yada. Bernie's sitting there all proud of his hair. He's got his arm around Paige. And then, just like in every homicide confession tape, Bernie slips up with a little, well, I don't kiss and tell. To which Paige swivels her head around like in the exorcist and is like, uh, what? And then Bernie starts laughing, and then they're all nervously laughing with each other, but they don't really know why they're laughing. Beads, I mean, buckets of sweat are forming on Bernie's body everywhere. And then he tries to deflect with this very, like, it reminded me almost of a Fred Flintstone, like, oh, Wilma's giving me the look. <laughs> yeah, but that do. I mean, the foreshadowing on that, if I were teaching still, I would have recorded that clip and played it for my students. Like, here's a great example of foreshadowing where you drop a little hint and it's indicative of things to come. 
So just as Bernie is thinking he's off the hook, they're all laughing for no reason. Su Chin is like, oh, well, thanks so much for coming today. Uh, before you leave, we have Brandy here. She's going to come on out. And she comes out. And at that moment, Bernie knew he had to take Brandy's side. Because if he didn't, Brandy was going to spill all of Bernie's beans. And Bernie cannot afford to spill any beans because he's on the last bean with Paige. Paige is what we would call hashtag triggered and starts talking about Brandy like Brandy isn't there. And that is pretty fucking rude. And Brandy had to have had a little pep talk from a producer. We all know how reality TV works because she is what I call the Leah from Teen Mom effect. She is standing in her power, y'all, and she is there to complete her mission. Now, because we all saw the promos and the commercials, we knew Bernie was going to talk about making out with Bernie. So it was just a matter of time. And the second we see Brandy looking around, she's trying to think to herself and find the producer that convinced her to tell it all on the tell-all. We knew it was on. She's thinking, okay, is this the moment I say it? How do I use it as a transition to get things going? And we find out not only did Bernie kiss Brandy, he gave her a hickey. And, okay, brace yourselves, he bent her over a chair, much like how I picture the Johnny Depp pirate did to Sonia Morgan back in Turks and Caicos. I mean, Bernie, Jesus, he's a brunette now. How could he do that? How could he give brunettes a bad name? Well, Paige is legitimately pissed. Anyone would be because Bernie not only kissed her, but he lied to her for months. And now instead of fessing up to it, he's doubling down on the lie, which just makes it so much worse for himself. So Brandy's annoyed because she's being called a liar. She gets up and leaves. And then Paige stands up and leaves and leaves poor Su Chin there, who is like, Bernie, burn, burn. What the fuck? You knew she was going to say something. What are you going to do? Pull it together, man. Cut to Paige, who's bumming a cigarette and a Diet Coke off of someone, and she books it outside where Ashley, of course, Ashley Snowden's got to get in on it. She goes into her Oprah mode, okay, insert the hand motions right here, and she's telling Paige to center herself, nurture the relationship with your sister wife, nurture the relationship with your husband, commit to it. Uh, I know Ashley's trying to be helpful, but listen, I would want to tie bow some chick's ass if she were trying to get all yoga master with me after I just learned that my husband, who just dyed his hair, by the way, that's alarming enough. I just find out that he lied to me and he was making out with some chick that was under my roof. Now, okay, I don't like Paige and I'm on Team Brandy, kind of, sort of, well, maybe not really, but do you know what I mean? Don't use this opportunity, Ashley, as your moment to lay the groundwork for whatever self-help bullshit book you got going for you. Just leave her alone. Don't be giving her advice just yet. And what about uh, Tammy and Sharice? Okay, let me repeat that. Tammy and Sharice, they are also there. If you were to pick any two wives there that you wanted to comfort you after you found out your husband just made out with someone, would you pick Tammy and Sharice? Uh, I like Sharice enough. I think she's probably pretty smart. But Tammy, I mean, Tammy's got a sectional sofa and a lazy boy in her bedroom at home. You can't trust someone with that judgment. And I haven't forgotten how she eats apples either. Now, meanwhile, Bernie has just hulked himself out of that microphone pack and he books it outside with all the husbands. Dimitri and Ashley, turns out they are pretty compatible. They're simpatico, if you will, because they're both grandstanding this moment. They're using it as their opportunity to be Snowden therapy, whatever the licensing abbreviation is after that, okay? But Jeff and Colton, I, once again, you guys, uh, maybe I am turned on by them. Well, no, I'm not turned on by them. I'm impressed by them. I'll leave it there. I think they're genuine. Jeff, the swinging on the tree, Jeff, yeah, I remember him. He gets fired up. He gets pissed. I did not see it coming. He seems very level-headed to me, but he jumps in there. And although I did not like the little 
tisk tisk wink thing he did to the female producer, like, mm, you can go now. I appreciate his effort to build Bernie up or to guide him back to reconcile with Paige and make a rational decision and come clean to Paige rather than, I don't know, fire him up and get him going to make good TV. Does that make any sense? Okay, well, somehow everyone is wrangled back to the stage where Su Chin does her best to wrap things up. Now, when it's Paige's turn to say goodbye, close their chapter, Paige gets up, walks around to Bernie behind her, and starts kissing his head like I do to my children when they are sick. It was very strange to me. It was very weird. I don't think I've ever gone over to Dave and just caressed his head and kissed it. But then Bernie reciprocates the same way. Then he stands up and he does one of those days of our lives, holds Paige and sniffs her hair and hugs her. Ugh, it just creeps me out. All right, now many of you missed this. And I know because I posted it on Twitter and Instagram the last second of the show. And some people were like, what are you talking about? Where did you get this? My recording stopped. But oh, no, no, no. After all the goodbyes, everyone's hugging, right? The credits are rolling. And just as it ends, we got a black screen of doom. It said, since the taping of this tell-all, Vanessa has separated from Dimitri and Ashley Snowden. And then, boom, cut to the next show. Whoa, 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 whoa. This is not a tell-all when you didn't tell us all TLC. We've got to know what happened. Now, immediately after that, everyone's going to Vanessa's Instagram, which, by the way, is Vanessa Cobbs with two Bs. And it looked like they were together as recent as a week ago. I know that they were on quite a few different podcasts from the end of March until early April, which is, what, last week? So what the hell happened? We've got to find out. I really hope they do like a Vanessa tell-all, Vanessa side or something like that. So in case you don't have Instagram, this is her statement. After some deep soul searching, I've decided to part ways with the Snowdens. I love Ashley, Dimitri, and the children so much and will continue to do so always. However, my love and commitment to them overshadowed my love and commitment to myself. I was not being truly honest with myself until recently. I was ignoring my inner guidance, which was telling me that I do not belong with them in the capacity they need me to. I now know that just because you love someone or a family does not necessarily mean that you are meant to be with them. Sometimes their long-established dynamic is not aligned with your own personal growth and path forward. Thank you to all who have supported us on this journey. Our love and life together was very real. I still believe that polygamy can be and is a beautiful thing. Love who you want to love out loud and proud. I wish Ashley, Dimitri, and the children nothing but love and happiness, and I know they wish me the same. Now, I don't know if I'm naive or I'm just very biased, but I do actually believe that Vanessa was into them or that she was into Dimitri. I don't think she was an actress just in it for the money. I think the Dimitri, the Dimitris, I think the Snowdens are, but I don't think Vanessa was. Dimitri posted on his Instagram the following, We are deeply saddened by Vanessa's decision to leave our family. We take our family dynamic and the relationships we build with others very seriously. We make sure we always do our best and give our absolute all. We also know we must respect when someone feels they must move on and try to do that with a spirit of acceptance. While we had an incredible, loving year together with Vanessa, it is important for us to take the time necessary to heal from this divorce extracting the lessons and blessings from this experience and use them as the strength we need to continue moving forward with our dream to create a beautiful, like-minded Snowden family tribe. First of all, that is the longest sentence I've ever read. And also a like-minded Snowden family tribe kind of sounds like a cult. We know that it's not polygamy to blame as one doesn't blame monogamy when things don't work out. Compatibility, aligned values, and joy from everyone involved are most important in any relationship construct. We wish Vanessa nothing but peace and happiness along her personal journey and ask that you do the same for her and for us. We truly thank you, our fans and critics. Well, there's fans. Oh, shocking. For the first time, our amazing journey has occupied on your screens, hearts, minds, and blogs. We will continue to live this journey out loud and search for our sister, wife, or wives when the time is right, because we know the women we are looking for are also looking for us. Ooh, shivers up the spine. 
And then he also posted a photo of the anklet and a ring, and it's all curled up. Oh, you know what, Vanessa, move on. And you know what, if she was acting, bravo, I believed it. And I'm just very relieved that you're not with them anymore. Until we hear any more and that we get more news, I think you know what we need to do. This is going to take all of us. I think we all have to do some deep diving. We got to follow all the leads we get. We got to get to the bottom of this breakup. What happened? We deserve an answer. We deserve it. God damn it. It's Easter. We deserve it. (laughs) All right. Well, what else do you deserve? Oh, I know. Listening to Amanda and I recap 90 Day Fiance before the 90 Days season two. I'm talking Paul and Karini, Ricky and Jimena, all the best of the best. That's at patreon.com slash Amanda and Jody, four bucks a month. You request the shows you want us to recap, new ones, old ones. We'll break it down and it's just a lot of fun over there. So head on over, of course, patreon.com slash realitytvpod and Moms on the Rocks. We get into the royal baby plan this week and also such an incredible Shiro. Make sure you tune in. Find me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at RealityVPod, especially during our shows. I love to live tweet as we're watching it together. So head on over there and until next time, stay salty. Stay salty.